Comparative and Public Law Seminar. Um, our speaker today uh, is Mr. Sebastian LaFrance uh, from Canada. Uh, it would be misleading to simply describe him as a prosecutor, or only a prosecutor from Canada. You will have seen from his bio uh, that Mr. LaFrance has a most interesting background. Um, he has some accomplishments that um, many people would envy. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's clerked at the Supreme Court of Canada, at the Court of Appeal of Quebec. Uh, he's also been counsel at the Supreme Court of Canada, which is a very uh, prestigious position to have. And you would think that uh, an individual like that would uh, be working maybe in a big law firm or not, but instead Mr. LaFrance chose to go to one of the coldest places probably in the world <laughs> to work, uh, Nunavik, one of the uh, Nunavik, thank you, the territories in Canada as a prosecutor. And in fact, he was here uh, last year uh, telling us some really interesting uh, stories about what it's like to prosecute in the Arctic uh, of Canada. And today, uh, he's now uh, going to enlighten us about his current work, uh, dealing with some uh, really um, uh, not, so, uh, not so cold uh, uh, material, but uh, 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 very important topics that are of great relevance to us here in Hong Kong, money laundering and proceeds of crime. Um, and uh, he is very open to uh, Hearing your views uh, and comments, he tells me. Um, and um, without further ado, uh, Mr. LaFrance, please take it away. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I'm really, I'm really uh, very, very happy to be here with you today. And uh, thank you for joining us. So I'll be uh, presenting, contrary to last year, where, where it was about the, the Arctic, the topic will be warmer. Uh, a bit today, shall I say. It's going to be about money laundering and proceeds of crime in Canada. Uh, why, first of all, why talking about this topic from, why talking about the Canadian law? There are many parallels that can be established between Canada and Hong Kong, so it may explain the interest of this university in knowing a, a bit more about what's applicable in Canada to that extent when it comes to uh, money laundering and proceeds of crime. There are also differences as well. It's not everything that is similar, but there are similarities and differences that make the topic, I hope, interesting for you today. Um, thank you also for the generous introduction. Um, so I'll be uh, speaking about, for first of all, why, why is it so interesting and um, I would say, uh, why is it such a hot topic to talk, to talk about money laundering? I'll, I'll just bring your attention right away to, the, to this slide. I'll go back to the first slide after, but the, you will see huge amounts of money are money laundered every year. And of course, this is only approximate, approximate numbers. Why? Because basically, uh, not all money that is money laundered is reported. Uh, you will not see criminals knocking at the door and saying, hey, 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 I stole $5 million today. Please note it down in your books. So all these numbers are approximate numbers, but these are horrific uh, and concerning numbers. For example, uh, when, for example, the United Nations estimated uh, back, it's, it's old numbers still uh, from 2005, but about 400 uh, billions, not millions, but billions dollar in the American dollars per year uh, are, um, are happening or are done in drug trafficking. And as for the money laundering on the planet, it's between $500 billion and $1 trillion. These are crazy numbers every year. And these numbers are not, like I said, they're not even necessarily the reflection of the reality. So this is a big problem for, uh, of course, the government of Canada and any governments in the world. And these guys, the criminals who money launder, um, have to be uh, 
considered and attacked in court as much as possible, not attacked, but I mean prosecuted by the government uh, when possible to do so. So this is why knowing more about the law that's applicable to money laundering offenses and proceeds of crime is so important. Because, because these are big numbers. This is very important criminality happening in every part of the world. Not only Hong Kong and Canada, but it, in almost every single country on the planet. Uh, you, you have to know that money laundering and drug, why did I mention the the value of the drug trafficking in the world. These two things, the drug trafficking and also terrorism and also money laundering goes hand in hand. Terrorists will not go to the bank and say, well, can I have a loan of $1 million and talking to the manager uh, saying, okay, what's the purpose of the loan? Oh, I would, you know, I would like to um, have uh, this and this building explode by next week or oh you know I would like to have a bomb killing about 2,000 people so would you give me two million dollars for it to accomplish that goal I consider it to be illegitimate of course it never happens so the money that terrorists use stem come from uh, most of the times from the criminality from the criminal world so this is why also you must not forget it's not all money launderers who are terrorists, but see this as a Venn diagram. You know in math, these circles that are inclusive with one another? So you can basically uh, set it up in a way where uh, terrorists take the money or may take the money from money launderers. And also drug traffickers are also seeking to, like what we'll see when we'll touch upon the definition, definition itself of money laundering, but the, the same thing, the same uh, funny example applies to drug traffickers. Let's say a cocaine trafficker uh, made $1 million, goes to the bank and brings a million dollar, he tries to deposit it, and of course the bank has the obligation to, not the obligation necessarily all the time, but they have some kind of obligation. I will not touch about the FATF or FATF elements here. Uh, FATF is, a, is an organization that, that basically uh, checks transactions, for example, so, suspicious transactions and that's an international not an international organization but that's an international uh, body let's say um, that supervises it and so money traffickers go to the bank tries to deposit the money and of course if it's money coming from crime that is uh, that the criminal tries to make legitimate by depositing in the bank well what's going to happen if that person is charged with criminal offenses. If the money is deposited directly in a bank by the drug trafficker, it's gonna be very easy for the Crown to say, well, the connection between the money and the drugs is there. We have, so you know, the money launderers, and I will jump to the definition of money laundering to illustrate you more why it is so important. So the definition here, and that's one, there are many, many definitions. So there is not one that is better than, or a best definition of money laundering, but basically what it means is it's money or a property, more to say, uh, that comes from criminal activity is trans transformed um, into something that is legitimate. So this is, so the, here it says the process by which, from Carolyn Denny, uh, who's in her PhD, wrote that definition, the process by which one conceals or disguises, and the concealment and disguisement are keywords. So they conceal or disguise the true nature, source, disposition, the movement, or ownership of money for whatever reason. So it's a, it's a broad definition. The, uh, the, 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 the money laundering offense, let's go back here for a moment. So you must know that this is very recent. 
It's uh, in Canada. It's provided by Section 462.31 of the Criminal Code. And until when it comes to proceeds of crime, until 1999, uh, the forfeitures were reserved to specific things. Now it's provided by Section 462.3 of the Criminal Code and is defined in that section. To go back really quickly to uh, the drug traffickers and the interaction between drug trafficking and money, money laundering, um, just to show how important drug trafficking, and I'm sure it is the same thing in Hong Kong for sure, but there are United Conventions that Canada ratified to insist and show how seriously Canada considers drug trafficking around the world. So the uh, three conventions are the single convention of on narcotic drugs, the Convention on psych uh, Psychotropic Substances, and uh, more recently, the United Nations convention Conventions Against Illicit Traffic in Narcotic Drugs and uh, Psychotropic Substances. But why do we say, why do we use the term money launder? Why launder? Do people put that in a washing machine, uh, put a cycle, and then the money becomes uh, crystal clean? Uh, no, it's basically, uh, historically speaking, that goes back to the New York Mafia in the 1920s, the, you know, the Al Capone uh, period, era. So basically, the laundromats were used as facades for criminal activities. So what I told you about the example where people are, the, the, are trying, or criminals are trying to transform illegitimate money or criminal tainted money into legitimate money. So they were using these businesses, the laundromats, to launder the money, not physically in the laundromats themselves, but by using these businesses as a facade to basically try to have their transactions, their illegal transactions, look like being legitimate when they're not. So drug trafficking and money laundering, like it's said in one of the uh, decisions in the Singh Dillon, that's showing the screen here, uh, they, they, they work hand in hand. So one, drug, you won't see any drug traffickers who don't money launder. So in the Ontario Court of Appeal decision and track, which is a very interesting and very important decision, uh, what it says here is basically what I told you in, the, in different words in terms of definition. The money laundering is achieved by the injection of cash generated through criminal activity into the legitimate commercial mainstream through the deposit of that cash with a reputable deposit taking institution like a bank, for example. But reality, let's have a reality check here. Let's look at the reality of money laundering. You'll see several examples of how criminals try to transform illegal money into legal money. So they may use casinos. Well, domestic laundromats, it's honestly, uh, it, it's not a, that's an example from the 1920s, but <laughs> nowadays it's, cares about laundromats when you can use all the other tools. Uh, but lottery tickets, uh, you can have someone, for example, let me give you an example. There was a case in Canada where uh, one person had a million dollar, why lottery tickets? That person had a million dollar, there was an investigation, and uh, the person said, no, that's money that I won with the lottery. So that's totally legitimate. I had a lottery ticket and I won a million dollars. So this is where the money comes from. So this is not money laundering money. It's totally legitimate. So yes, I, don't, I didn't have a big lifestyle before, but then I have a big lifestyle because I won the, the big jackpot. So this is something that in the course of inv investigations, when the police investigate, that's something that the police has to check. Uh, as funny as it sounds. Did that person win the jackpot? And of course, it's easy to check by calling the lottery organization, but that's something we tend to forget. It's not an obvious thing to say, well, okay, that may come up, but that may be an argument. And of course, if the Crown doesn't have 
the proof that this person, the criminal, didn't win, that could be or substantiate potentially a good defense and say, well, no, it's legitimate, I won the, the lottery. Credit scheme, uh, no, I'll, I'll move to purchase of assets. So the main, the main example uh, in the uh, Toronto area, I, I believe there are many, many, many millions. I, I had the number in mind uh, that I forgot, but it's more than a hundred million dollars, I believe, of houses or buildings that are owned by criminals. Why? Because it's easy to launder the money. Like, let's go to this here, this example. So how does money laundering operate? And let's take the example of the house. So how money can become, can be transformed from being criminal into something that looks legitimate and totally fine and totally legal and totally not criminal anymore. So the first step for money laundering is the placement. So basically the money stemming or coming from criminal activities is placed or deposited in a bank account. Of course at that time, we, the, the criminals don't advertise it that this is criminal money, but they try to invest it into the mainstream, uh, mainstream resource as a bank institution. So once that money is there, they convert and then they purchase goods with that money and that purchase is totally legitimate in and of itself. Everybody is allowed to buy a house, a car, or anything else. But the origin of the money that was criminal, then in the newer transaction in the second step of the money laundering step, the converting or layering. So you buy a house and then, well, it's fine, that's a house. That was bought with money from that account. And all of this, you have to keep in mind that all of this is done in hope to make illegal money and transform it into illegal assets or money or property. And the third and last stage is integration. So let's say the house that was bought, for example, with criminally tainted money is sold on the market and the purchaser doesn't know that it's coming from legal assets and then it's totally integrated that money is laundered and the new money that the criminal would get from the sale of the house that was bought with criminal money then it's all good it's all legit money or legal money because the purchaser didn't know anything about it and the money that the person used is expected to be unless that other person is also a criminal but that person is it's a pure honest transaction in the first place. So all these steps, and I had a discussion, a really interesting discussion with uh, recently with RCMP officers in Canada about that, and the, um, one of them challenged us, well, it doesn't work necessarily the, this way. It's not like these three steps, the, the placement of the money or concealment of the money, so you hide the money, and then the second step, the layering of the money, of the conversion of the money, and then the integration of the money. Why do we need to do that? Why do we need to put these steps? Because these are all theoretical conceptions, notions. Well, the, the, the use that I would see to this to categorize, to put labels on these categories would be simply to track down and say, well, Mr. X or Mrs. Y was involved in the first step of the transaction or second step, it may help at the sentencing stage, for example, when you uh, try to say, well, this person was involved in every single transaction, let's say one criminal was involved in the placement of the money, in the, the conversion of the money, so with the house example, so that the money was coming from illegal assets, then invested, and it's all done by the same person. Of course, that person, his role is really major, as opposed to someone who was involved on the side, helped in only one step, so it may help to that extent at the sentencing stage, for example. It's not the only reasons why these categories exist. Also, it helps to when you have the, in the greater scheme of things, when you wanna locate, because usually it's not only one person who's involved in these transactions. When you try to define the role of each person involved, 
this, these categories also help to do a big picture of things, basically. But again, these are only theoretical notions, right? So the criminals don't say, oh, I will place the money this morning and then maybe in a week, I'll convert that money and uh, I'm busy, but I'll put in my calendar two months that I will integrate that <laughs> money. It doesn't work that way, right? So they don't, criminals don't schedule accordingly to that table. Oh, gee, I'm not gonna comply with that table. Oh, I'm in trouble. No, no, it's only for the prosecution, the police, to help them, assist them, in order to uh, basically put labels on, on things and to see the evolution of the money as well. When you investigate, uh, as a police officer, for example, um, if you know that the money is at, is at its early stage, at the stage of placement, that's a good thing to say, okay, let's get resources more from the government, let's uh, start a bigger investigation. You know, in terms of planning the work that has to be done in the context of the investigation also helps. Uh, as opposed to if it's at the very end, well, it may be, it may call for different types of resources. Um, uh, or, I'm not a police officer, but I would be happy, I understand there is a police officer in the room, I would be happy to uh, hear about that. Um, but that's how I dealt with it so far with the police officers I work with in, in Canada. So here you have a table where uh, you have the three phase, phases, stages, so the placement stage, the layering stage, and the integration stage. The very, very interesting issue of predicate offense. The uh, section 462.31 in Canada that defines money laundering, and I would like to have this section itself so you see it. I have it. Apologize to skip from one slide to another. Just give, bear with me for a second. Section 462.31 says that the money laundering has basically to come from the commission as a result of, this is the wording of Section 462.31, so the money laundering uh, must be a result of the commission of an offense in Canada. So that's the wording of the code itself, the law says so. So what does it mean? So that means that it makes any money laundering offenses more complicated than other offenses. That offense itself, it's not a standalone offense. So it's not like an assault where buddy punches the other guy in the face. There is no, you don't know, you don't need to know that his neighbor told him the, the day before that he threatened him. No, the assault is very easy to prove. One punch, that's an assault. Money laundering, it's a different story. Because you may have, um, you, may, you need to prove that the actus risk of the offense is the, the fact that illegitimate or criminal tainted money is invested into the, for example, the uh, economic mainstream, the, the, any bank institution, and then they try to make it legitimate, but also you need to prove the, the, the fact that this money itself comes from the commission of an offense. So it's also criminally tainted. So that's why drug trafficking and in terms of legal uh, requirements, this is why, for example, the Crown needs to prove that not only the money is dirty, to use uh, an expression here, but also that the, the not only enough, I, I put the example upside, sorry, I'll, so the Crown doesn't, know, doesn't only need to prove that the money itself is um, dirty, but also the origin of the money, that it was used for uh, a bad purpose at the root of it. 
A, a good example is this. My sister tells me, oh, uh, I got $200 million that I would like to give to you. Can you put that in the bank tomorrow? And uh, I would like you to deposit it. It's because I'm a drug trafficker. I found no job, so I just became a drug trafficker. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I wanted to be, buy a good a big PlayStation to uh, my son, and then she, she does that. She doesn't do it in the real life, don't worry, guys. Uh, she's an honest person, very nice. Uh, so she gives me that money, and it turns out to be a joke. She never worked in the criminal field or anything. That's money that she, she got from our grandmother. She didn't tell me because grandma didn't leave me any money. <laughs> she didn't want me to be upset about that. She only got the money, but to cover it up, she says, well, um, I'll give you the dirty money. She, she make up a story. So could we have here a money laundering offense? The answer in Canada would be totally no. It seems obvious with this example, uh, of course, and these examples never happen in court, but the predicate offense, so the, the offense at the origin, at the root of the money laundering offense, in our case, that was legal money. So I believed that it was money connected to the drug trafficking or something because my sister was convincing, uh, even though she doesn't look like a criminal, but she convinced me that it was coming from, so I believed it. It could be an attempt. Could be an attempt, exactly. So there is a Supreme Court of Canada decision that makes a difference between these, an attempt to money launder and money launder itself. That's the attempt to money launder that's been discussed by the Supreme Court of Canada and DYNAR, D-Y-N-A-R. Um, but I will focus on a very good point. So the attempt itself to money launder, I could be prosecuted for this because I believe it was money laundering, but it wasn't. But to have a real, so that definition here, the, the Crown must prove that the accused is aware. The awareness at section 462.31, that awareness is depicted, described as knowledge or belief. And these are very important key words. So the knowledge, you have to know that the money at the root, at the origin of the criminal transactions were drug money or criminal money. Or the belief, like the sister I just gave, the example I just gave you about my sister, that's a belief. So the belief now is enough. There was a, a after Dianar, the that section of the criminal code was changed. Uh, because basically, initially, only the knowledge was to be used. But now it's the knowledge and the, or the belief. If you have to prove the knowledge, it is more complicated. How do I know, for example, to take back the example of my sister, how do I know that what she said is real? I don't know. I just believed it. So the belief has a way lower threshold in terms of evidence evidentiary requirements to be proven in court. So a belief would be honest. But then comes up the other question. What about entrapment? What about there is a police officer that says, works as an undercover officer, um, brings a, a luggage full of cash, and pretends to be a criminal, and gives that money to, that, that's a possible tactic, they do that. But they also get more evidence. But let's say we only have this piece of evidence. Police officer comes up with $1 million as an undercover officer. The other guy believes that this is criminally tainted money, but it's not, it's coming from the police. But this is used in an operation to have the other guy use that money in order to prove that there was the commission of an offense. If there would be only that piece of evidence, that money that was used from an undercover officer, well, there, there, there could be a defense, potentially, I don't say there will be, but it could be entrapment. So even though, but then what, what it, it's usually done in hope to get more evidence or more surrounding evidence admissions, for example, by a potential, per, a potential accused that he will admit to um, commit 
uh, offenses related to the drug uh, world or is something like that or to mount uh, to uh, have other uh, transactions operated so that can be used as an incentive but in and of itself this could not work why because the origin the criminal origin of the property itself like it says in drakes that's one of the decisions that's relevant from uh, the ontario superior court well the, the accused is aware of the criminal origin of the property but here it, it, it there was no criminal origin at all. It was made up, which is fine and to a certain extent if there is a belief that. So, so these things are very nuanced and complex. So here, um, that's the Hong Kong offense. That's, yeah. yes. But you, you have a judge here, and that's why I, I put it there. I, I, I was very proud of myself when I found it out. I gotta be honest with you. That was uh, many months ago, and I wanted to impress uh, Professor Young by my deep, uh, sorry, worries. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, impress Professor Young with my deep knowledge of the uh, Hong Kong law, which is actually uh, turned out to be not be uh, that good, but anyway. Here, um, there is a judge from the uh, Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal who wrote about Canada. And he said at the very end, I will bring your attention to the, la to the last sentence of that paragraph. So the Crown doesn't need to show that the accused belief was correct. That's exactly the example I told you. The, the police can use as a tool to say, well, I'm gonna use money that's legitimate and convince uh, someone I suspect to be a criminal committing money laundering offenses uh, and in order to catch him at the end of the day. But the Crown would not necessarily need to use that the belief was right. If someone accepts on the, to uh, go to the bank and or whatever, use some money, dirty money, money for money laundering offenses, well, the belief is there. I believe it. So as for the proceeds of crime, so that I found the, these pictures really useful. Uh, sometimes a picture says it all, and here it does, I believe so. So the, the proceeds of crime offenses, and these are cute pictures, admit it. Uh, the proceeds of crime provisions, uh, that's the fruits of the criminal activity, as opposed to offense-related provisions that are basically obtained, uh, are the tools of, and well, how is it so? How, how, the, uh, how can we distinguish proceeds of crime and offense-related property uh, provisions in the Canadian Criminal Code? There is a case uh, that's really useful for, to us, that's called the, uh, from the Ontario Court of Appeal, the case of Tourette, D-U-R-E-T-T-E, from the Ontario Court of Appeal. In that case, basically, uh, the police was trying to seize uh, money uh, from uh, someone and the money was only on the person himself in the car that was uh, and drugs Also was found only on the person and the police uh, Basically was trying to seize the money on the basis that it was offense related property and to try to seize the car as well What the Court of Appeal said in that decision in the red D-U-R-E-T-T-E Which is right here so the, the Court of Appeal said that there must be a nexus, a link, in terms of evidence between the property to be seized to the offense itself. So if you would like to seize, uh, in that example, uh, the, the, the accused, Mr. Durrett, that all the drugs was in his person and not in the car, so what do we do? Uh, the Court of Appeal said, no, you cannot seize the car. If drugs or anything else is found in a car or anything else, you can seize that property. But if you don't um, see it anywhere else, and pay, only on the person, you cannot. So that, that brings a, a big distinction. And that, that, that is also very useful for, because like I said, proceeds of crime 
and money laundering offenses are intertwined and connected to each other, so that's something to be known as well. So for example, if a drug trafficker is money laundering and brings uh, lots of drugs on himself in a car and the police arrest him and they want to seize the car, they won't be able to if the drugs is only on the person himself. It has to be found in the car as well. So in terms of seizure, in terms of detention, you cannot seize the money and that, or and the drugs or anything else that's, that would be uh, criminally tainted. So just to uh, do a lay of the land in terms of the very basic terminology when it comes to uh, proceeds of crime and offense-related property. So th there are many things that the police can do, which are really useful tools. Because of course, when you have criminally tainted money, because you remember I told you uh, the, the initial stages where uh, criminals are trying to bring uh, the money or property or to money launder and make it legitimate, there are tools to prevent that, or at least make sure that this process, the three steps, the three phases, will not work out or can be broken uh, th uh, thanks to the police when they, they, they make these applications, but the Crown Prosecution has to defend them. So you can see, so a seizure warrant. So you can, like in the red, you arrest someone, you seize the property, could be a car, could be a house, uh, could be money, could be anything, any property. It's very, very broad. Uh, you can restraint, and what does it mean? So the the example of the house that I gave to you uh, guys earlier. So I uh, have one million dollar uh, from drug money that I <coughs> I buy a house with, and then I would like to sell the house to somebody else. So it you know the, the third stage, so it can be integrated into into the legitimate mainstream. So what the police can do with the assistance of the Crown is to have a restraining order, restraint order. So that person will not be able to do anything with the property or the house. So that person, let's say they want to sell the house to somebody else. If there are even cases, and I had one recently with uh, another senior counsel uh, on a case where we stopped the selling of a house, of a $4 million house to somebody else. So that, these are really useful and important tools in order to stop the crime to, to be committed or the money laundering process to be stopped by the police. So you, like it says here, you prohibit the, any person to dispose uh, from a property and then you, because what happens? Let's say the cell goes through. I'm a criminal and I money launder and I have a friend, uh, let's say, let's call him random name, let's say Simon Young. So I go and see <laughs> Simon and I say, hey Simon, uh, would you like to help me out? And he says, yeah, sure, but Simon doesn't know I'm a criminal guy and I'm trying to money launder money. Simon is a good guy, a smart guy, he knows what he's doing and you say, oh, that's a good opportunity to make a bit more money. So yes, why not? I sell the house to Simon and then the police Try, doesn't do anything because they don't know yet and they come at a later stage and they realize, my God, Sebastian sold a house to a third party, but that third party, Simon, is, has nothing to do with the criminal activity of, Simon, of, uh, of Sebastian, so what do we do? Well, that's a problem. There, there are several solutions to this, but would, would the police be allowed in Canada to say, well, we're going to seize and restrain the house in the house of, in the hands of Simon. No, they can't, because that's something that's in somebody else's hands now. That has nothing to do with the commission of the crime. So that's why these tools exist, and to prevent, to, uh, to make sure that the dirty money will not be legitimized into the commercial mainstream, right? So, and the objective, of course, at the end of the day, let's bring you. Let's go to the forfeiture order item, the second in the list here. So, the idea when you seize a house, at the end of the day, when you seize it, you, you uh, want to make sure that when everything is over and hopefully successfully in court, you want to forfeit the house to take it out of or the criminal 
tainted property or money to take it out of the legitimate mainstream, uh, commercial mainstream. So to isolate it to a certain extent, give it to Her Majesty or give it to the public, basically, and make sure that this money will not be legitimate anymore. So you forfeit it and put it back in the hands, in the hands, uh, in the hands. I'm sorry, of the the state. So the state uh, remains in charge. The management order. It's basically uh, more, a bit more administrative. Um, it, it, it's how you're going to manage this. So you have an order to make sure that this will be taken care of by the state. So it's not the prosecution nor the police who keeps uh, deals with uh, the, the 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 housekeeping basically of. Uh, the, the seized items. It's going to be uh, in Canada. It's called SPMD. Uh, that's the acronym. That's the uh, governmental uh, organizations that basically make sure that the money seized, the property seized, are kept and dealt with uh, in good condition. And uh, because basically, when that 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 could be. If I add this example, I'll, I'll tell you why. Why is it so? Why do we care? When you seize a car, why do you care? That's coming from a criminal. Why would you need to keep the car in good condition? That's a criminal. So who cares? Well, the criminal, if the car is crap or in really bad shape, when you give it back, let's say the crown is not successful in the prosecution, you have to do a return order, the third item. So you have to return the car because the crown was not successful in its prosecution. So, or before, if the, the case is stayed, for example, for lack of evidence or anything else. So you have to return the items which were considered to be illegal in the, in the initial stage, but now it's not. If the car or anything else is not kept in good condition, that person can say, well, not only uh, was my case dismissed and stayed, but my car, my beloved car, is totally not in good condition. So that person may sue the government. And so this is why it's so important. Uh, when I started working in that section, I, I, I didn't understand it, to be honest with you. I said, well, why do we care? Well, we care because of that. Because we want to make sure the bad people will not come back and uh, insulting us in addition to the injury and make sure that they will not uh, make us feel like um, bad. So we have to keep it in good shape for that reason, basically. And that's the difference from Hong Kong is, in that situation, the Attorney General has to give an undertaking. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Exactly. So uh, again, uh, again to again to to make sure I, I was uh, making a good impression of uh, Professor Young. I I quoted. I'm joking here, but this is something that I really found very interesting, and that, that judge uh, particularized several questions and issues that prosecution has to deal with when dealing with the uh, this kind of uh, prosecutions. So the judge at the uh, Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal. So when you target the, the proceeds of serious crime, well, to what he asked the, the following questions. To what extent must the criminal source of the money be identified and proved? So that, that's the predicate offense. How, how for it, and practically speaking, what kind of evidence do you need to say, well, this is coming from drug trafficking? Do we need to prove that? Because an investigation, practically speaking, may never end. When it comes to big networks of drug, drug traffickers, uh, who usually are not only working in one country, it can never stop. An investigation can last for 50 years. So you have to draw a line somewhere. So to what extent must that origin of the criminal painted money be proven? That's a difficult question. How much must the person dealing with the funds know about their provenance? So, well, in Canada, I would say we have the answer. Well, the, the answer, the not so clear answer about that, but it's either, and I think it's the same in Hong Kong, we have to have the knowledge or the belief that the money is criminally tainted. Um, 
but, but that, that's something that still bugs me and I'm talking to you right now and I, it still annoys me uh, I, I will I will uh, that's something I would like to talk to you about and I would like to hear from you if you're uh, if you catch the ball about that but um, we have two standards one is really tough uh, to prove for the prosecution the knowledge and and of course it's tougher for an investigation to say that a person had the knowledge that there was a uh, the commission of an offense where the belief is any belief is easy I believe well it's easy it's not that easy but to what extent do you need to prove a belief in terms of evidence what do you need so these are two different things and they call for two different steps in every single investigation and of course for police force not because they're lazy but just because it makes their life easier you would tend to go with gathering evidence to support a belief rather than knowledge right because it's easier to prove for the crown so the police being also nice to the prosecution will say well we'll we'll gather as much evidence as possible to prove, to prove a belief since we don't know to prove the knowledge of the criminal origin anymore but why do we keep these two standards in the law? Is it anachronistic? Is it, because it, one seems to become somewhat superfluous. Because obviously, when one thing is easier, human nature will go to the easier things. If to get a lollipop as a child, you need to do 20 hours of homework, as opposed to spending 20 minutes to uh, do the same thing, which one will you choose? Of course, the, the, the easiest way, because it's easier and you get the result faster, the, getting the lollipop. You have the same thing here. Um, th there, there are answers to, to this, because there are some cases where one could say, well, there are cases where the, the knowledge will come up and we can prove that the person had the knowledge because we have recordings of conversations uh, where that the criminal <coughs> was saying, admitting that he was uh, laundering money, etc., etc., then you have the knowledge. But, but, but that's, a, that's a good answer, and it's not at the same time. Because in the belief, you have the knowledge. The knowledge is included, right? If you believe something, of course, you, you know that, or you can know, or no, you know, vice versa, sorry. The knowledge includes the belief. So if you know something, you would believe it. So I have difficulty with these, these uh, yeah. Well, it's nuanced, right? So you, you yeah. have the two thresholds, and you, you want a conviction. So if you can't get it on the higher one, you have to get it on the lower one. Yes. That's yes. It. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. And they're both thresholds. Yeah. So, I mean, you're not just getting a conviction on the lower one. You still have to meet the threshold. Yeah, you do. Yeah. But why do we keep both in the same? So we can get higher penalties for the ones that meet the higher threshold. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. In terms of sentencing, perhaps it yeah. may may impact. Indeed. Yeah. Unfortunately, the case law in Canada, there is not, there are no so many decisions yeah. where this the, the, this very distinction came up in terms of sentencing. So at least it was it. in a CFA case that was quite similar to this question. Yes, yes. Yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. So. What are Yes, I think we can go. We move on to the questions. And, yeah, thank you for okay. for coming. So we have time for some uh, questions, answers, comments. Yes, Russ. So the obvious question is, how do you prove belief in in, in Canada? <laughs> <laughs> I know how you prove belief in Hong Kong, in this law, but I'm just asking how you do it in Canada. Of course, we don't need to prove belief. Don't need to prove no, belief. having reasonable we grounds. Show reasonable. reasonable. Yeah, that's right. You prove what the reasonable man and reasonable grounds for yeah. you, which is not yeah. something at all. Yeah. Well, um, wiretap is really a useful tool. Uh, in, Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, you cannot use the evidence from Hong Kong. No? Oh. Well, that would be a major distinction. How, how do I prove belief from inference? How do you infer somebody's belief? That's how we do it in Hong Kong. We use inference, inference from circumstantial evidence. But, but, but in one of the cases, and I want to be careful, but uh, in one of the cases uh, I'm aware of, uh, conversations may be used, and then you can prove that the person believed. Right, that's that, direct evidence, so you can show that. Yes. Yeah. But how do you prove belief when you don't have direct evidence? 
Well, circumstantial evidence is very strong in money laundering offenses in Canada, and it's used on and on and on and on. So, so it's, yeah. Well, it, 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 for example, if uh, I just don't want to use something from my ongoing case, but uh, yeah. let us <laughs> yeah. because I can't. Speaking right? hypothetically. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> for example, so let's see. Uh, I'm uh, I'm the criminal guy. I'm having a million dollar in the trunk of my car uh, that I transport, that I carry for somebody else every week. Um, I, I'm not told that this is criminally tainted money, but I'm doing this every week, and the person at the other end, I know that this guy is not rich. Uh, and I do a X number of trips between two cities to carry money from one place to another. I had to believe. Like these circumstances themselves, of a, it's not necessarily a transaction. Well, it is a transaction, the, the, the fact that one person gives okay, to but what, what if he says, I'm really stupid? Well, well that, it's not a defense. Yeah, it's not a defense. It's not a defense, defense if you use the reasonable man, but it is if you use the person, because it's his own personal belief. But you, I think you'd have to show no. his cognitive abilities. Or so you're using the reasonable man to license. Well, that's, you know, the, the uh, yeah, the, I, I could be uh, having this argument pretty soon in one of my cases, but, um, so thank you very much for that question, actually, yes. Uh, but, but if you, yeah, you cannot ignore the law, the criminal code. For first of all, it's not the answer to this question. I will answer it directly after, but you cannot ignore the law in the first place. So you cannot say, and it will be up to the Crown to prove that, well, maybe that person is stupid, but, they had to know, like they had to know because of this event. Uh, the the it's not normal to have a million dollar from one other, from one person to be carried over to somebody else over a number of weeks, for example, or uh, to do X number of transactions in a bank account. Why this person didn't do the transactions themselves? So you're using so, the reasonable man as the standard, not the criminal himself as the standard. I'm sorry? You're using the reasonable man as the standard, not the criminal as the standard. Yes. We, we have the, the case criminal. here where, remember the, the old gentleman who, who was the friend with the other old gentleman? And, you know, it was a question of, Simon knows this case very well, and he, he said, you're my friend. I have this money. Can you just hold it for me for a while? Yeah. Okay. And what do you do with a guy like that? Well, you can't let him go because everybody then has an old friend. Yeah. But you can't punish him to the full extent of the law either because he is pretty much an innocent dupe. John, paying in, in Canada would be a no, no non-starter. No, um, non-starter. Non, non-starter because yeah. he didn't believe. Mm. Uh, yeah, there was no be evidence to show otherwise. You have to say that he, he was lying. It must be also a subjective belief or knowledge. So a general knowledge that the, so that's something, thank you very much, sir. So yeah. for, professor, I'm sorry for, for this. Uh, mm -hmm. the, Circumstantial evidence works, uh, but the police force also must keep in mind that because it's a subjective belief or subjective, so it elevates the standard a bit more. Uh, so just the, if the Crown were to say, well, everybody would have known, or on the common sense standard, or objective standard that, well, doesn't make sense to do this, it wouldn't meet the threshold of what's provided by Canadian law, because it has, has to be the mens rea, the intent, has to be subjective. But what the Crown would reply to this, and using the very same example, or both examples, the examples that was given uh, earlier is, well, yes, but he had to have the intent, like there, 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 there's no way someone would not believe it or know or something. So it's, it, it's all about, it's really factual oriented, factually. Uh, Driven. Um, uh, are you aware of the HSBC case in Mexico City? No. 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 Well, they got caught out for laundering, you know, millions and millions for the drug cartel. So I was going to ask you: Have there been any similar cases in Canada where, where you know, big financial choose has been caught out as you know being agents of of money laundering? Uh, I'm not sure I, I not because I that I cannot answer this question, but I'm not sure I can answer this question because of um, 
my work. Uh, I have to be careful about what I'm saying. So uh, I, what I can tell for sure as a general fact, we have um, the Mexican cartel is a big problem in Canada, and uh, to say the very least, in terms of money laundering offenses, uh, South America as well. But the uh, Mexican drug cartel is definitely an issue that the Canadian police force is well aware of and have all hands in the mud, basically. So I mean, this, this is where civil forfeiture comes. Yeah. Yes. 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 More questions? I can ask another one. I'll be asking you, with your forfeiture order, are you forfeiting the actual asset or are you forfeiting the value of the asset? <laughs> Well, that's why SPMD is so useful. The organization that I told you about that took, uh, takes care of uh, the properties and goods, uh, they, forf they they really take care of the assets themselves. So you forfeit the actual assets? Yeah, so when a car is seized, the car is brought to X place and location, and then it's taken care of, and yeah. But Canada has something, uh, that's if the asset dissipate, yeah. you can get a forfeiture in order in lieu, sorry, yeah. uh, a fine in lieu of forfeiture. Yes. So, 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 so then it looks, starts to look a bit like our confiscation. Yeah. If we confiscate the value, it not the assets. So. Yeah, the value can be, yeah. Uh, but, but like Professor Young just said, it, it, let's say like the example that I gave you earlier, the, the, the house is sold in the, in the hands of a third party. Uh, that's the example that I gave about the uh, hypothetical Simon Young and uh, myself did this transaction. So let's say the, the money is out of the, net, the network and it's gone to some, so we cannot retrieve it, We can't, the police cannot seize it, then there could be a fine, for example, in lieu of forfeiture where the focus will be on the offender himself or herself instead of the asset itself. So that's, say that was obvious because once you sold it, it's no longer crime proceeds. The yes. crime proceeds are wherever the, the money went that, that Simon gave you for the house. So that's the crime proceeds, not the yeah. house. Yes, and that's section 462.37 that deals with uh, these things, the mm. fines, the legal forfeiture. But I don't think the fine you get is not the amount of money you got from the sale of the house. No. no. It's the value of the proceeds of the crime. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So the house may have gone up in value, yeah. but the fine, I think, can't be that, that, that amount. Would the concept of a constructive trust apply there, where the proceeds of a crime are used to increase those proceeds? Can you constructively say that the entire sale of the house, even if it's increased in value, is proceeds no. of crime? No. No. You, no. Can you can trace the uh, proceeds if you can still find the tainted asset, right? And it's still tainted. There hasn't been a bona fide purchaser. And if it's increased in value, you can get the whole asset. But what we were just talking about is that sort of alternative plan B is to find a new forfeiture. Yeah. And I don't think you can have trace in that. No. Trace the increase in that. Yes. That's unfortunate, though, because, uh, of course, if an asset gets, I don't know, houses, for example, in the Toronto area, it's, the, the price is ex it's always increasing crazily. So uh, that would be more uh, interesting, of course, for the state to get a bigger amount at the end of the day, but unfortunately it doesn't work. It's not that permissive. Okay, so on that, uh, again, a really interesting presentation. Uh, and uh, you know, is, I know you've only been in this area of the law not a very long time, but uh, very detailed and comprehensive and thank you very much for sharing that with us uh, today. Um, of course, on your uh, bio, you were described as a polyglot, and I won't, I won't tell uh, the audience how many languages you speak, but I'll just say that it's double, double digits. So maybe the next time you come, you will present in, in Cantonese, Cantonese for us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in thanking you.